This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by eight amazing people. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Michael Fritschke, Yvonne Williams, and Doug Malam. Thank you all so very much for helping make this show possible. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I have with me tonight, I believe for the third time, Mr. Bernie Taylor. Hey, Bernie. Howdy. Thank you for having me on the show again. And I have just Googled, where did the go- road go to song? There isn't one. <laughs> so maybe that's something we need to work on. You know, a theme song. Um, you, you've got the voice for it. I'm tone deaf, so I'd be worthless. Maybe <laughs> for some lyrics. <laughs> well, I know lots of musicians, so I can always ask someone to come up with something. Absolutely. We're gonna do some. We're gonna do some fun stuff today. I mean, it was fun what we did probably like three years ago, maybe. Yeah, twenty twenty. I think twenty twenty was the last time you were on. Yeah. So and things have things have changed. I mean, not just in my world, but in the world itself, things have changed. And, and we uh, there's some definite archaeology, anthropology, prehistory, P.T. Barnum type updates. <laughs> P.T. Barnum one. type. Mm, okay. Yeah. And uh, so we're gonna talk about Homo Naledi, Homo Naledi today, and it is a complete pt barnum story that like people could never imagine happens in the real world okay all right and you've written yeah. uh you've written two out of uh, of a three-part blog on your website about this yes so my mo- and this is uh, this is not an advertising from me before ryan.com is my, my web page and i've got it i've got two or three part blogs and the first blog um, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through the concept of these blogs, what what the storyline is. Because yeah. as I was writing the blog over many months, this, and I, I kept updating because the storyline updated, not <laughs> my storyline, but has the as the Homo Naledi story evolved. But the story of Homo Naledi goes back to 2013 at the Rising Star Cave in South Africa, and there were two cavers, two amateur cavers, two like really skinny guys, and they they went down this deep chamber of a cave. And they they flashed their they flashed their hand their flashlights probably a better way to say it, and they saw bones they saw like a lot of bones, and uh, and the bones were all fossilized so that obviously they're not you know modern humans they're not us right so it wasn't it wasn't one of their buddies got lost in the cave and right came, you know it's not not you know or nobody like threw their you know their, their worst enemy down the hole and they, <laughs> so these were very old these are very 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 old. And so they reported the discovery of their discovery, the two guys, this is really their discovery, to Lee Berger. Now, Lee Berger is a paleontologist, hails from like Pennsylvania, not, no, Virginia or Tennessee or something like that. We're not going to go to Pennsylvania. It was <laughs> south of there. And he became a professor at University of Wits. I don't know how to pronounce the whole word in South Africa. Okay. And he, he, he did find uh, fossils in the past, and he, he – he's, I mean, they were good. They were good fossils. I mean, it was, I'm not a paleontologist, not my stick. Um, but what Lee was always very good at, it was a sensual, sensationalizing things. So he is truly a P.T. Barnum. Like, gotcha. like nobody's ever done even better than P.T. Barnum. So, and, and that became the narrative for all these years. And so uh, he wrote a book, Almost Human, lots of world tours based on the information that these 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 um, people had found back in 2013. There was something very interesting. When they took their photos, they they noticed when they take the photos, these two amateur cavers, that they were broken fossils in there. Very interesting. So somebody had been in there um, after the bones were fossilized. Right. And I'm not a paleontologist. I'm pretty sure it takes more than 50,000 years to fossilize these bones. Okay. Based on my quick like, research on the internet. It's not, it's not central to the story, but for sure, Homo naledi which dates to 220 to 330,000 years ago, which pe- nobody's arguing about that dating, was in the cave. And, mm-hmm. um, but somebody had been in, the af- in the after that. Now, so that was the narrative that, um, that um, Lee Berger had for, for a few years until about, about uh, three years ago. Lee Berger hooks up with a producer doing a Netflix documentary series called Unknown, Netflix Unknown, and uh, it's called Cave of Bones. And so the... the a videographer follows him around for 
I mean, it was over probably at least over a year or two period, but it was, you know, it was there for the moments. And so they, by that time, so Lee loses a bunch of pounds and I couldn't fit in the cave either. So I have no judgment on this. Okay. There's no <laughs> way I can put down these chefs. I have no judgment. So Lee, Lee loses a bunch of pounds and he gets down in there and it's like the last time, the last time going in there during this documentary series. And the first time he's been in there, the, the only time he's been there since 2000, since no, he's never been in there before. Right. So, right. so it, it was found in 2013, but it wasn't until like 2020, 2022 that he gets down in there for the first time. And he's he's seeing things from a different eyes than everybody else because um, they're looking down at the fossils, whereas he's looking at the cave, and he sees these engravings. Now, as Lee tells the story, and you can hear it on Netflix, of Cave of Bones, Net- Lee tells the story is he has this mystical moment where he sees stars and all these sort of things. And he describes it as the, the Queen's Gambit when she looks at this, the chess player, looks up the ceiling and sees the board playing. And that's that's his that's his narrative. And um, for sure, he was under stress because he had a hard time getting down. He's probably going to have a hard time to get up up the, sh- the, to the daylight. Yeah. And so he was truly stressed. And he probably had some sort of like um, a moment, you know, some sort of mystical moment that was generated with his own chemistry. I, I have no doubt about that. But he sees but what he does is he takes some pictures and the, then the video crew took pictures um, and he comes out of the cave system and he, he shows two two other associates on the project. Um, two other anthropologists, and they and they show him pictures that they have, pictures that they've taken at Gorm's Cave in Gibraltar. And then they say your hashtag that you're looking at in your in this in this cave of bones, the Riding Star Cave, looks just like the hashtag in Gorm's Cave. A few problems with that whole thing. A few problems, but we'll get to those later. So Lee says he forgets the whole storyline of there being broken fossilized bones when they first went in, in 2000. 13, no one was in there before there. They knew knew they knew, they didn't know who it, he says, I don't know who it was. I don't know how long ago it was, but it wasn't us. Therefore, it was somebody else. And um, so he forgets that whole narrative, and all of a sudden, Hobo and the Lady has made art. Mm. And uh, and that's his that's his that's his story. And he takes that he, he's he's about to take that story to the world because he is working on a Netflix documentary. And he's he's doing the PT Barnum thing. He's sensationalizing. He's also got a book project in line. He's got a world tour for this book project, and so he's got he pulls pieces together. He's got these three articles going out for peer review. Oh, I, I I know one went out for peer review, and and they, it gets it gets ditched. I, somewhere in the literature, I said I read it was Nature, and they said no, but it was definitely one of the big journals that said absolutely not. We're not going to go with this thing. So he's got a problem. Lee Berger is heading towards, he's heading towards, he's got this documentary coming out. He's saying it's science. A journal has said, we ain't going to touch this thing. And so he sends it out to this, this sort of so-called peer, pre-peer review journal. Mm-hmm. And they, they tell, he puts out this narrative that we're sending, and, but, but, by the way, before the pre-peer review journal comes out, he does this worldwide media tour, a virtual tour. And um, so the whole world has seen this thing before the papers come out. Right. And um, already, it, actually, the papers have gone up. But people are, are reviewing them, um, pre-peer reviewing them. Never heard of that before. But it's all, it's the media. It's around the world. Lee Berger has made these incredible discoveries. Homo and Lady Berger, they're dead, and they made art. Therefore, they're like us, homo sapiens, modern man. Um, you, you, you and everybody on this podcast listening right now, well, he's still listening, we'll say. So Lee Berger tells he comes out tells the world he he's discovered the the, the missing link of sort of sort of thing and that Homo and Letty had spirituality because they bur- buried their dead and that they made art so they have the cognitive capacity even though their brain is half the size of ours and that's and it's a media splash and I'm gonna tell you there, there it, there's two sides there's three there's actually three pe- three groups on this thing one group who just doesn't like Berger says this is completely bunk you have no evidence for anything. And then there's another group that says, Lee Berger, we love you. We believe everything you say. Right. <laughs> I can tell you that. And then there's a, still another book group that says, you know, we should start. Let's give Lee Berger the benefit of the doubt. And and um, because there's a lot of stuff going on here, we can continue to study. You, have, you can imagine this is, this is modern science, right? Mm-hmm. This is modern paleoanthropology. This is going out to the entire world on the Internet. And still, the pre-peer-reviewed papers, which I've freaking never heard of before, um, three of them are out there, and they haven't been peer reviewed. <laughs> Even that, so nobody. This has been no no scientific examination of any of this stuff. Right, and uh, so the pre peer review papers do get reviewed by the by ten people. Ten people reviewed two papers. Um, actually, five reviewed 
I reviewed um, one, I reviewed the other, and there's a okay. summation paper of the other. Uh, uh, that was a third. And all ten gave, like, thumbs down. And we're not talking just, like, thumbs down. They, like, they threw him under the bus, and they rolled back and forth, back and forth over him. <laughs> okay. Over his theories, I should say, or his hypothesis of what he came out to say. And then, um, so it became, like, this this media spectacle that people probably saw in, like, June of last year. Home no letty, but scientists say no, and other people just don't like Lee Berger. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it'd be mass- massive. And what's, what people didn't realize at the time that he made these huge discoveries is Lee's got a documentary coming out. I believe it was August of last year for, the, for on the Netflix Cave of Bones. And Lee has a book coming out. And Lee is going on this world war, worldwide speaking media tour to promote the book, um, his latest book on the subject. And so does, does that – so that's what we'll, we'll like pause for – I'll pause for a second here. Is that kind of your remembrance of that time period? Yeah, from what I followed of it, yes, definitely. Okay, yeah, and it was, it was. I mean, all social media. I mean, it was Lee. Lee is the ma- is the ma- he 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 is the he is before PT Barnum. He is the master of the game without any question at all. So then, what happens is that the um the papers they so he the, the pre peer review thing gets totally ditched. Um, and he ha- he goes out. He says, "Well, we're going to now take everybody's ideas, what they have, they criticize us, and we're going to go out to do go out for peer review for a real journal, which he did. He got the thumbs down on, you know, many moons before that. And then they say, this and it's Netflix, so it's huge. It's absolutely huge. So you know, tens of millions of people watch this thing on Netflix, right? And which 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 create a huge problem because in this so called scientific process, which he has just completely thrown out the window." He hasn't val he hasn't validated anything except he's got a darn good story and he has completely um, he's, he's he's completely mixed it up and there's a back there's a there's a there's a, there's a cloud over this story too. There's this guy who wrote a book and he said that all ancient religions come from not just psychedelics but rather people mixing alcohol with psychedelics. Mm. Don't get it, but whatever. Okay, and. Uh, He's on, he was on Rogan and all those sort of programs. Well, he's working with Lee Berger on the side. And so they're, they're trying to come up with this hypothesis about it has something to do with, you know, miss some mystical thing that Lee has, that is act, had, allegedly had, is somehow connected to alcohol and drugs. And so it goes back to the whole stone date theory. Whether you believe it or not, this is what they're talking about. Okay. And uh, so you got this like cloud hanging over the whole, over the whole, the whole thing. Okay. So the, so then a, the, so I said there are three people, there are people groups. There's people who love Lee. Everything is wonderful. Um, they, they, they just don't like the guy. And third is, you know, we're, you know, let's let's see what happens. Well, the people don't like him. <laughs> they write their own paper, <laughs> and uh, and what they did was they is they have no data one way or the other. They have no data. I mean, there's nothing. All they have is what Lee says. And um, they've never been down there. They, they they didn't look at anything. And they um they came out with this paper. Based, they took news stories, what people said in news stories, and put them together into a paper. So when those, so we're going to go back to the the the, 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 the engravings themselves. Because we, so I'm. I first thing is I see these images and I said, yeah, darn right, they look like those Gorham Cave images. Yeah. Because I was I was really the only one who studied that. I'm, I'm the only one to study. And that story goes back to 2000, uh, 2013. That the Gorham's Cave is is, is, is within the Rock of Gibraltar, and it's um it's a natural cave. People had been opened up about um 1920 or so, 1925. And people have been going in and out of there for years. People have been studying for a long period of time. And about 2013, somebody noticed, oh, there's some lines in that rock. Let's go take a look. They washed it off, and they saw what they said was a hashtag. Again, hits the news in a big way. No evidence for anything. Um, but they had it in a they had a so-called period paper, but the, it wasn't the kind that people actually studied the data. And the people who – there was some like dispute in the paper about what, in fact, this was. Well, the the people came out, and what the Lee Burgers, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this Gorham Cave team was doing was the same thing Lee Berger. They were, except they were promoting Neanderthals, Neanderthals, okay. and they were pushing for a UNESCO World Heritage validation of the site. And they UNESCO wasn't going to give wasn't giving it to them, and so they came up with this Neanderthal narrative to push it push it over the edge. And UNESCO bit bit it, and because it was Neanderthal made the this is the first known art of Neanderthal in the world. And what these guys what they tested was is they tested whether it could have been done by naturally, like wait, you know, water coming to the cave, or if it was done, could have been done by by um, people, you know, mm-hmm. or Neanderthals in our case. And they definitively came out, it was not done by the waves in the cave and all that sort of stuff. And this and what they did was they they told this um they, they came up with the Neanderthal part of it, 
because they were already pushing this narrative to Neanderthal. And allegedly, Clive Finlayson, who was the head of the project, was the world's expert on Neanderthals. And anything he finds must be Neanderthal, sort of like the Holy Burger sort of stuff. Well, okay. so we have two narratives. We have this narrative of this of this hashtag that's in this Gorm Cavage Walter, which is looks a lot like the hashtag in South Africa at the home of the Letty Cave. Now, when you say hashtag, you mean you're talking about like a, uh, a two cross lines with two cross lines, like an actual hashtag. Yeah, it's actually a hashtag over a hashtag. Exactly. Okay. And so and so, it's, so that's how we would we would identify, and that's how the news identified it. But it's not actually it's not actually. I mean, there's no. So it dates to about 34, 36,000 years ago. So back, so back to the Gorham Cave is they've got these two hashtags, um, one in Gibraltar and the other one in South Africa. And the, and the team has recognized that these are common. But the problem was is they didn't really know what the Gorham one was about because of this whole Neanderthal nonsense. And they, they, they fudged the Neanderthal thing. Is this, this this hashtag is up kind of a, a, a stone table and it's flat in the table and the, the Homo sapien level of of, of um, remains or stuff or we'll say artifacts goes down let's say from there to ten feet and then the Neanderthal is under under the ten feet and they believe they say that the the, te- the Neanderthal level sort of creeped up the wall about ten feet underneath the Homo sapiens level. And laid on top of this hashtag. <laughs> I mean, you, you just you can visualize the absurdity of the whole thing. Yes, but that's that was that was their story. That was their story, and uh, and they got they got people called them out in that and in in the in the media and things like that. But nobody nobody could ch- ch- prove one way or the other because nobody was allowed to go in the cave to investigate any of this crap. Sorry, pardon my French. Yeah, nobody fine. was allowed to go <laughs> investigate it. In fact, there are three ways so you can go see this cave, the Gorham Cave at Gibraltar. One way is you have to be good friends with Clive Finlayson and the family. The second way is you have to win some sort of a lottery in, in Gibraltar, so you know, ten kids a year or something. And the third way is you have to go on a very high end cruise and pay for an excursion excursion with a very limited number of people. And huh. so it became this money making thing, a, a basically financial fraud on the part of the Finlaysons. And I have absolutely no no qualms in, in saying that because that's what it is. Right. And um, no, so nobody can go see this thing. Nobody can go take pictures. But most importantly, since they took their they, they took the original photograph of it when it was cleaned off, nobody has cleaned it off to take a photo again. And there's only one photo taken, and I have the photo. And uh, the photo has you, you won't see it in any media, like any of the news stories and things like that. It was only it only appeared in the journal article when they they had this release back then. But I I bought the the rights to use the photo from one of the, the photographers. Nice. And so I had this high resolution image. Nobody else in the world has that I blew up like in a you know two by two, or maybe it's a three by three. And I could actually look at this thing and I could you know do some some technology throw some technology at it to see what what it really is. And to start off, and it's actually incredible. It's probably one of the top three artifacts in the archaeological artifacts in the world. And I'll tell you the home of that like Rising Star Home the Cave of Bones is another one. And another one, the other one is we've talked about for the gallery of discs in northern Spain. So this 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 um this hashtag thing at your bulger is you can actually lay two finger your hands over each other and now you know the size. So it's actually in this so-called hashtag, you, your fingers fit within the lines. Okay. So it was scaled, it was the hashtag are actually the scaling of the hands, which is pretty cool. You know, it, I put my hands over it so I can do that. So it's like really awesome that they scale it in. But what you see, there's lots of animals on this. And one animal is, is two giraffes. And they, there were no giraffes in, in Europe at that time, either during the time 34, 36,000 years ago or the time of Homo Leti 230,000 years ago. Mm. So the artists had been to Africa. That's really important, really important concept. But there's also, there's also in, three images of Homo sapiens. And um, they're really good images of Homo sapiens. And they're on my blog. You can see them. Yes. Um, and so we can actually two of them, three of them Homo sapiens. Another one, I have no freaking idea what it is. But what we can see is that this was not made by Neanderthal. <laughs> okay, this was made by Homo sapiens. Um, and so it asked. So then, what we have now is we've got this hashtag at in the at uh, Grom's Cave of Gibraltar with Homo sapiens that matches. It does not just match it. You can overlay it on top of the the one in South Africa. And there, these artists were related to each other in one way or another. I just don't know how. But they're. I mean, maybe they're cousins. Maybe they're distant cousins. <laughs> But these, they had one had seen the other's hashtag, right? Because you just couldn't, you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. You couldn't just make this crap up. And if if you you have to, have, if you someone, if you had never seen a draft and someone said describe you what a draft would look like, you you draw a horse with a long head, right? Sure. Or a long neck. 
and it, it just wouldn't look like a giraffe. And so the, the Gibraltar artist had been to, been to Africa, seen a giraffe. Now, here's where the story gets like, like totally incredible. Back when I was working on the Gore Matching and I was working on the Gallery Disc Image, I was assisted by George Shower. George Shower, then and now, is the world's foremost wildlife biologist. I met him in China. And what I'm 59 now, I met him in my mid 20s through a mutual friend at a kind of a gathering, at the main tombs, anyway. That means anything to anybody. And um, I contacted George back in 2014. He helped me out, and we worked through these animals. And the, the, the Gallery of Discs up in northern Spain, and the the gourmet the gourmetching one, or actually they overlap in the in the animals. One is the gourmetching one is square. The gallery just is rectangle. You can go to my webpage for right time. dot com. You can see it. Well, when George, we were working on the gallery just one. George, we fought, we found the giraffe. George said it was a Maasai giraffe. Maasai Maasai giraffes are in South Africa. There are lots of giraffes in North Africa, in Niger, you know, throughout mm-hmm. the Sahara. There's there's giraffes. But George says that's a Maasai giraffe. And so we pondered, well, maybe Maasai giraffes 36,000 years ago had been more further north into into um, Northern uh, Africa, into North Africa, where, where people could easily swim across the Strait of Gibraltar and see that possible. So then, this, so then we this on the, the this this cave of bones hashtag, we also have a giraffe. We sort of two giraffes, and in, in both in the cave in the giraffes in the cave of bones, the giraffes in the in the Gorm Cave, Gorm Etching, and the El Castillo Gallery Dis. What's distinctive about them is it's not just a draft, it's a draft and the juvenile, mother and her juvenile, she protects them. And they, they sort of cross their, their their necks or their head or their heads. Yeah. Okay. So you have this you have this motif. It's a motif. It's absolutely a motif. And for the El Castillo one and the Gorham one, you could you, you could figure out the direction of these of these animals and the two these two in the north, they face now, they go south. Because there's other cute there's other clues that tell us how these things are oriented. They go south. And um and so all of a sudden, this this home this rising star cave thing pops up, and I see the giraffe. I'm like, oh my god, that's the giraffe. That is, it's the same freaking giraffe. Hmm. And uh, so we, it just completely, it answered the question that I had, George and I have since 2014, is where did the giraffe? How did the Maasai giraffe get on these Iberian caves? Yeah. Um, and people say, well, it's an awful long way from you know Gibraltar, the Iberian Peninsula, down to South Africa. But it actually, it is and it isn't. Uh, tw- uh, Saharan Tuareg, Tuareg the, blue men, the blue people of the Sahara, they walk over a thousand miles in foot every year. And they stop for weeks along the way or months along the way. And so p- for you and I, it's a long way. But yeah. it's not a long way for, for nomadic people. It's just, it just isn't it, isn't it? I'm going to tell you a quick a side story. It's really cool. So what long time ago, I wrote a book called Biological Time. came out about 2014. And a year or so later, I got this – I can't remember it was an email or a letter from a woman called Fiona Campbell who, who lives in the United Kingdom. And she said she, she read the book. She loved the book, and she was going to relive the book. And the book is about how at plants and animals on time. So she was going to live off the land and not you know, you know, know not just picking you know plants, but at the ocean, you know, harvesting, knowing based on the tides and the moon and, and – and, um, I talked about big games. So I don't know if she killed any big game, <laughs> but I thought she was freaking nuts. Okay, she was going to live this for a year. So, so Fiona Campbell um, lived lived the world of you know fishing, fishing and and gathering animals and all this sort of stuff um, for a whole year. And she wrote a book and she sent me the book. and And in that book, she, she talks about everything she did. and And I googled her and I found out, well, Fiona Campbell had actually walked around the world. How? And she wrote many books about it. And she was famous for this. And so, can people? migrate long distances in you know rel- you know within a lifetime within a few years or even a year the answer is absolutely yes because fiona campbell did it my, my friend fiona and uh, she went on to f- start a like a wilderness awareness school where people you know learned learn what she did and um so it's kind of cool how did so she, how anyway did, how did she walk though i mean she would have to take boats across like the atlantic or pacific so yeah so she so we'll say she she walked across all the continents Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that'd be fair. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a fair question. So yeah, she uh, she did, and people can look F Y O N A Campbell, and I believe she's Scottish. She's okay. Scottish. But um, but anyway, definitely in the UK. But so the so can people walk around the world? Can people walk long distances? Can they walk from Iberian Peninsula to to South Africa? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not even a stretch of the imagination because people still do it today. So what we have here is we have people in Iberian Peninsula with the same symbology. The same animals in the same order, and you can overlay one image on top of the other. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Thirty-four to thirty-six thousand years ago, and so it tells us that there was there was not just cultural exchange, but these people were connected. They knew each other. They were um, they were probably trading. 
So how the heck did people th- how did heck did people get from the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa? Because we see all these animals, there's all these animals tell where they are in time and place. But there's a huge gap in animals between the Iberian Peninsula and South Africa. A huge gap in animals. And so we all these animals in South we have a we have a bunch of South African animals on the on this cable cable bones rise and star cave image, which is really cool. But what we don't have is we don't have the animals between South Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. And then it picks up again to have all these Iberian animals. So how did people get from how did people get from the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa? Well, the, if if you look at the, the images, if you don't have those animals in the middle and they, and they were navigated by the animals, therefore they didn't navigate across north and south on the land. They had to have navigated on near near shore co- coastline. Okay? So they had canoes, and but this the map this it does become a map, but the map only goes north to south. The map does not go east to west. So this is these people did not sail out the Atlantic Ocean and come down again. Um, so they they must have taken canoes or some sort of small craft that they went along the shoreline and they were na- and they were uh, and they were navigating that way because all these animals and all these places are actually constellations and on the Iberian ones we we actually matched them exactly to the, the the constellations among the ancient Greeks and the missing constellation I had throughout this process was what the heck is the giraffe I had no idea I'd given dozens of presentations on the astronomy of these upper hills of the caves and I have it. And I'd go through all these animals, and I say, "Well, this, this, this. These are the Greek. This is that." And um, and then I, I would, I would, you know, I just like whiz by, <laughs> I whiz by the draft because I just didn't know what it was. Well, when the, this this uh, home and life story came out, the Rice Star Cave, I started researching what is the con- what is the constellation for the giraffe in South Africa. It turns out that it's the Southern Cross, and the crossing of the the draft, the mother and the dra- juvenile giraffe's heads are actually the cross. Okay, That's what cross it? Southern crosses, and the. Uh, so the and and the missing the missing constellation as I was going around all these presentations from one animal to the other among the Greeks the missing constellation I had there was the Southern Cross hmm. it was the, it was the it was the it was the piece of the puzzle I didn't have it's t- it's totally crazy it's totally crazy and so the why I say that this Rising Star Cave is one of the top three artifacts in the world even though it's not Homiletti is that the other two are the one in the Gorms Cave and in the El Castillo Cave in northern Spain right. together they for, they show this picture of humanity that distances Europe Crossed the Strait of Gibraltar to South Africa in three images, and so I, I, you remember the story. Remember the story of Plato, and Plato says that the so-called Atlantes they were people who they were people who were um, they had the distance of Africa. They covered the distance of Africa. Mm. Well, whatever whoever Plato's source was, is they had seen these images. And when they saw those images, they saw, well, there's a giraffe. And they knew, they knew the same thing that George Schaller did, that that is not a North African giraffe. They knew it was a Maasai giraffe. And by knowing it was a Maasai giraffe, they knew that these people who had seen these apelithic Im- who made these apelithic images, had actually been to South Africa. Um, and that's where they knew the giraffe. And that's will be how we, I could connect the pieces of this puzzle. Um, and so it's been, it's kind of been like this fascinating journey through time and space since, for me, since 2014. And the Cave of Bones narrative, um, or the images uh, that Lee Berger and friends believe are uh, Homo Naledi, but they're saying they're the same as Neanderthal images at Gibraltar, which right. aren't Neanderthal, that match up to um, Homo sapien images that we have actual images, portraits, or let's say profiles of Homo sapiens going back to 34 to 36,000 years ago. Completely different story than you will watch on Cave of Bones, which I, I believe people should watch. It's really interesting. Um, and so it's been like, it's been this sort of fascinating journey that you and I started like four years ago. We talked right. about these images. Um, well, also, so, so, well, also, I mean, we're talking a time period that's during the Ice Age where the sea levels are also about three to 400 feet lower, which means the Mediterranean is a much easier or a much smaller body of water, much easier to cross, too. Oh, yeah. Well, it, you know, even today, people swim, people have like races across the Strait of Gibraltar. It's about, I think it's about seven miles across or so. It takes three okay. miles, I'm sorry, three hours for a strong swimmer. And people go back and forth, back and forth. And the trick is to catch the, the so the, it's the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar connects the Mediterranean with the Atlantic. And the tides go in one way, or the currents go in way and the other, out the other way. So if you catch the tides, sorry, the currents right, it's a lot easier because you're not swimming against it. Gotcha. Um, you just got to make sure you don't get thrown out to the Atlantic. <laughs> right. But people do this with boats. Yeah. And three hours. People do three hours. So this is 
And you, if you're at, if you're at the Rock of Gibraltar, um, you can look across and you can see Jebel Tobacco. I'm sorry, not Tobacco. I'm Jebel Musa, which is um, it's a pareidolia of uh, Muslims say the biblical Mo- Moses, but it actually looks like a pregnant woman. Um, but you can look across and you can see you can see Jebel Musa across. So it's not so they. It wasn't like looking across the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe something's there. Maybe isn't. Um, you could actually see um, North Africa from, from Gibraltar, a no, normal person's vision. Yeah. So it wasn't very far. But Jerry, you're right. So um, 34,000 years ago, the, the sea the sea was about 30 meters shallower, so about 100 feet shallower. And people could have walked walked differently. Um, well, the, the, the stretch, stretch course of Australia Gibraltar was a lot narrower. But people potentially... Could have walked along the shoreline um, to South to South Africa. Yeah. So they, maybe they didn't even need any boats. They just followed the shoreline, and you know they went south, um, and then they went north again, and they knew how to to span this distance. Okay. So it's 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 not a big stretch stretch of the imagination. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's um so when we when we talk about um, human uh, story of humanity, we talk about out of Africa. We never left Africa. It never happened. So thirty four thousand years ago, there was still trade back and forth. Right. right. Which and makes at sense. At some point, the trade stopped, and because what happens is about twenty, actually, it's about about thirty thousand years ago, we stopped seeing African animals in Iberian cave art. It just stops. And so the we, we don't we don't see any more giraffes and we don't see any more Barbary Barbary apes, which was the Barbary ape was indigenous to North Africa. So we we so somewhere about around that time we stopped going back and forth in that direction. And maybe we we went around the Mediterranean, you know, via the Sinai Peninsula. But this we never really left Africa. We continued to trade back and forth. And so people think of this, you know, these two separate identities. We're not. So so where where do these people come from? Where were they before thirty four thousand years ago? About two thousand and sixteen, major story came out in the scientific media at, at a place called from a place called Jebel Erhud, which is in Morocco. And in Jebel Erhud, Morocco, they, Je, Jebel uh, means uh, mountain, and so it's the mountain of Erhud. Well, they found Homo sapien remains um, that were dated to three hundred twenty thousand years ago. So we're talking Western North Africa. And what's What's interesting is that. Prior to that, the earliest known Homo sapiens were 240,000 years ago in Southeast Africa. Mm. So the narrative had always been, you know, so we, we evolved from chimpanzees somehow, or split from chimpanzees, and we, um, you know, and and then we 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 emerged out of uh, Eastern South Africa. But the Jebel Ur Hood fossils show that we're actually 320,000 years ago out of West North Africa. Well, if you swim across the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, you're in West North Africa, I and mean, that's where you are. In fact, if you when you let if you, you know you step up on the beach, you're probably a week's walk away from Jebel Ur Hood. Right. Well, this 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 narrative of of Homo sapiens throughout time is not anything what we ever thought it was. Or anybody could have imagined because and all of a sudden in, in these last it's literally been ten years, the, my work, the uh, the Jebel Ur Hood work, the, the the Cave of Bones in South Africa. All these pieces have come together to tell a completely different story of what anybody ever could have imagined, um, that we have this very deep history. The deep history is of not separate you know, people in Africa and people in, in, in Eurasia, but rather people that have been traveling back and forth for God knows how long. Um, actually, I'm sure God knows how long. But, <laughs> you know, I sure as heck don't know how long. Um, and so if we have dates of homo sapiens fossils 320,000 years ago, they were Homo sapiens there longer than 320,000 years ago, and it tells us it tells us a completely different story of the history of man of mankind that um, none none of us would it could have even imagine. So going back to Lieberger and going back to the cave of boats and uh, and, then, and and the documentary, well, it is hugely successful on Netflix. It's if you type in cave of bones, Lieberger, Homo Naledi, it's hugely successful <clears throat> on social media, but this. So the nar- my narrative and is um, I mean it's out there and Berger and all his friends know this narrative and they've kind of like shut they've kind of they shut down their the Homo Naledi art story <laughs> they completely shut that one down um, but they're they're trying to re- and they they're going back to study the engravings they actually have people study rock art now study the engravings um, and they they've moved away from the last person in that cave until those cavers went in there 2013. They moved away from Homo Ludi was was the last one in the cave. Right. Um, 
and they 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 they're, they're now looking at the concept of who was there after the home of the and before those first amateur cavers um, drop down shoot into the the well of sorts, um, which is a you know it's a it's kind of a coup. So I'm I'm not a mainstream scientist. I'm not really an alternative scientist either. But I'm somewhere you know floating around in the middle. It's kind of a big coup that it, the the narrative and the, the story was stopped. The this nonsensical story, and but the narrative was was literally reformed um, through from this alternative space, um, and not through the, the traditional ways. Because in the traditional ways, there was you know there's people who loved Lee Berger, there are people who hated Lee right, Berger, right. and there's people who are like you know let's give this thing a chance. And the the, the third group of let's give it a chance have already moved on to they don't like Lee Berger. Because they they got duped. Um, so we're, so we're, it's uh, been a fascinating, absolutely fascinating journey that is still it's still unfolding. So do you, how do you how does this affect uh, the timeline of Homo sapiens in general? Does it put it back older? Oh, inter- so, so interesting. So this is okay. So I'm not a paleoanthropologist. I have no opinion on what Homo naledi is or isn't. So there's lots of questions out there uh, by in the paleontology community. Is Homo naledi really a unique species, um, or is Homo naledi, you know, part of something else? Um, and the answer to that is God knows. Of course, God actually would know, as I said before. But the, <laughs> so it doesn't change. So Homo naledi, if it is a distinct species, it it broke, it branched off uh, somewhere early on from somewhere early on from something we don't even know what it is. Okay, let's put it that way. Uh, so the, the storyline of Homo sapiens does not change, except that we can go 2000, you know, 14, 2015. We knew about the uh, Virginia Hood, so that 320,000 years ago. That is that's now solid. But the story of Homo sapiens is that we were much more advanced than anyone ever believed, and that we were culturally connected, we were migrating back and forth to South Africa 34 to 36,000 years ago, and uh, it actually it's it's like. It's it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And those guys, Lee Berger's two friends who were who showed the image who had been to the Gorham Cave at Gibraltar and had showed him the image that it looks like that. They actually had the they they had it right that they were it, the hashtag looked the same, but they had it upside down. Mm. <laughs> and and the, you see the Netflix cable, they have it upside down. They got upside down. And uh, and so they they really couldn't put it together correctly because they 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 didn't have it. They didn't have it. They weren't looking at it correctly. But they also they you can see they're they're studying this thing off their cell phones. They're not studying it. They didn't blow it up into two by two, two by twos or three by threes, and they didn't use any sort of advanced software in their computers to look at it more carefully. It was entirely based on what the, the interpretation what Lee Berger saw in his heightened state of anxiety, having just squeezed through or stuck in this <laughs> chute coming down, and now he he doesn't know how the heck he's going to get out again. Um, and so it's a the, the the narrative that they that they tell and it's it's this live narrative it's in the documentary it's it's indisputable that these guys they had no freaking idea what they're talking about um but they they jumped out there into the netflix the media the mainstream media the you know across the internet and the people that the people that don't the the, the people that don't just don't like lee Berger, um they're not justified because they don't like him they're justified because the whole thing was bugged and then what happened? It was probably like in like September or so. I think it was September. There's a uh, some sort of like um, space inter inter not out of orbital, but not I guess not into space flight. And as a part of a publicity stunt, Lee Berger takes some of these Homo Luddy bullets, and he puts them in, a, in this like capsule in the pocket of one of these people, like like billionaire types who's paid yeah Google money to go into space. <laughs> and so what he's done, he's taken basically priceless, absolutely priceless, so rare artifacts, and he shoots them. He he sends them into space where who knows what could happen. And he, um, you know, and so then everybody who doesn't like Lee Berger just jumped on that one again. <laughs> and so the the PT Barnum thing is it's a truism. It's a truism. And we and but it was also the same PT Barnum thing we saw with the people at the Gorham Cave, and that they made it this this nonsensical story that it was, it was Neanderthal. Because they wanted to get UNESCO approval, and then mm. they shut the whole thing down, right. so nobody can go. And no, nobody can actually. You can go through the high high, high price cruise excursion. You can see it, but what you can't do is you can't see it that it's washed off. You can't see what's under the mud. Um, and all the images that they use in their publicity are either the mud covered version or a kind of like a, an outline, you know, a, a drawn outline. 
Mm. Um, and so they, you have these, these, um, this community that is pushing narratives that they know it isn't true. They completely know it's true, but they're stuck in the narratives because they put their reputation on, on the line. Right. And not only their reputations, but in the case of Lee Berger, he put the South African government. In the case of the Gorin people, they put the, the Gibraltar colonies, this is a colony of sort of protectorate. They put that government on the line as well. And so people get so entrenched in these narratives that just aren't true that they, they, uh, they're they stuck with them because they're still making money off of those narratives. Um, oh, yeah. Not yeah. just money for the, the purpose of the digs, the archaeology stuff, but like in the case of the Gorham etching at Gibraltar, they're making money personally in their pockets by selling their their ludicrous story to people on the outside, such as on these high-paying cruise excursions. Now, now – is that the story of um, paleoanthropology that you thought it could be? Yeah, yeah yes, kind of. <laughs> I mean, that's the th- the thing. Money, you know, blinds people to this stuff, as, as does dogma. You know, you, people are people. We we all tend to look through, you know, a certain uh, viewpoint sometimes, and it's hard to get away from it after a while. Yeah, yeah. I was on Jimmy Church a few days ago. He used that word dogma too, and uh, people and the dogma are people's eagles. Yes, uh, the dog. You know, their personal egos, it's their community egos because UNESCO bought into the whole thing. But before the, the, the government of Gibraltar bought into the whole thing. And now you have Lee Berger. He's got the South African government bought into it. He send these things into space. Yeah. He's got his university. Oh, Lee Berger is a is a is like a senior member of National Geographic. So National Geographic was published the book and they promoted the World War tour. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they're wrapped up in the whole thing, too. Yeah, ego definitely plays a part in all that as well. I mean, that's that's the problem. Our sciences are run by ego, money, and and the like, as well as maintaining a steady narrative. Uh, and it's it's all the sciences, really. Um, and it's unfortunate because it stops progress. No one wants to be. No one wants to be wrong. Nobody wants, and definitely not the South African government, and definitely not <laughs> University of Wits, right. just definitely not National Geographic. Because um, all these people, so based on the numbers I've seen out there, um, Berger's team, Berger is probably feeding. He has 100 people being fed off of his payroll mm. related to this project. He has the largest paleontology project in the world. Now, Home No Letty is an awesome project. No doubt about it. But when you when it goes in this direction that you you create the show is bigger than the artifacts, is bit, much bigger than the science itself, then you are, um, you know, it's, it's, it's P.T. Barnum. I mean, it's, yeah. it's totally out there. So there's, you know, you've had a lot of people in your show and, and other um, podcasts that they're talking about. There's an inter- there's another story out there. There's totally another story out there, and it, it's you know there's a story before ancient Egypt as we know it, right? Yeah. There's a yeah. story before Gobekli Tepe as we know it, and and there's a story before the Mayans, which of course is more recent than Gobekli Tepe in ancient Egypt. Um, but there's there's a story of Native Americans, which is more distant. Um, actually, I say. There's people before the Mayans, the where the Mayan story was is older than Gobekli Tepe, and it's old in ancient Egypt. Yeah, but there's this there's this story out there. We have all these pieces to the puzzle, and where does astronomy come from? When we just we're we're at thirty four thousand, thirty six thousand years right now, and I'm talking not, not astronomy itself. Look about Greek astronomy, okay? Yeah. So it's astronomy that we can recognize, not something people you know throwing spaghetti in the sky and, and coming up with a story. So where do these where do, where does architecture come from? Um. Where does our, our not inhabitation of caves, but our record keeping in caves that we we created a memory, um, a living memory that I can go back to these images today and I can say that's a giraffe and that's a giraffe from South Africa. It's a Maasai giraffe, um, and there's no there should be there should be no Maasai giraffes in Iberian cave art because there's no Maasai giraffes here, um, and these and many other animals. And so we have all these missing pieces of the puzzle. And this, you know, you go to the conferences, the alternative conferences. People are like, hey, this doesn't make sense. This just something happened. This was not the beginning of anything. Something happened before this. Yeah. And what has what's happened in recent years, not just my work, but other people's work, is that there's a there's a there's a scientifically based movement of this is how the pieces fit together. You know, it, it, no magic, and I'm not an anti magic person, but without the magic, you can put the pieces together. And it was in front of everybody's eyes all the time. So, as I say, Lee Berger, <clears throat> the cave was the first pictures of the, of the Rising Star Cave were made in 2013. But it wasn't until 10 years, nine, nine, 10 years later, that he enters the cave, squeezes through the chute, loses some weight, that he sees the engravings on the wall. Yeah. yeah. It was for the Gorham Cave in Gibraltar. 
it, you know, it was, it was, it was let's say, it was, I don't say on Earth, but the, the back wall fell down. You can see all this stuff. 1920s, 1930s or so. And people have been walking in and out of there doing archaeological work since. But it wasn't until about 2013, 2014, that somebody noticed the so-called hashtag. So how many how, – So and we're talking perhaps at least hundreds of people had walked through that, that Gorham's cave um, hundreds of times. Yeah, and so and, and had and that had the same look as everybody else. One day, somebody said, "Hey, look at that over there! It's sticking up. Looks like that in the mud. Looks like some mines." So how much how much of this stuff is just sitting in front of us that people are saying it can't be? It's not there. It can't be true. There's no giraffes in where you know places where there there are there, there's never been giraffes in these places. But maybe why do we? Why are the giraffes in these places? Where did these people go? Um, and what were their connections? It places that you know people think of ancient Egypt as you know old old, and then people start thinking about Gobekli Tepe as old old so about twelve thousand years ago. Yeah, we're talking about a narrative three times more distant in time than Gobekli Tepe. It's not to take away from Gobekli Tepe, but we've it's a completely different um, story. Um, that then you have to start looking at well, where how does Gobekli Tepe fit into this narrative? Um, how do the how do the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks and all these other peoples? How does it fit in with Native Americans? How does it fit in, in Mayans who came, who came after that time? How do we how do we put these pieces together? Because it's instead of looking to the sky, I'm not against ET world, but instead of looking to the sky for how ET seeded all these different things, right, right, we right. can start to draw a timeline that is so far back in time that before any of these things that you know, before you know, of course, go back to Tappy and Papa back. We can we can have a totally different tree of of time to see how these things could in fact be connected um, and where the stories come from because now we can look the story is really really old yeah and it keeps getting older it seems like I think I pushed the limit I need I need so where I am now is so I'm looking at how can we what happened before. Or what happened between 320,000 years ago and 36,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. That's where I'm looking for the evidence. I'm looking for evidence now because I want because I've I figured out the 36, let's say, to the ancients, um, and I you can pretty much, because we're so far back in time, we can trace um, cultural elements um, into the Americas. It's it's very easy to do. But the the, the question then becomes: Well, now what happened before? What how how far how far back in time were people actually had cultural exchange and trading between South Africa, yeah. and Iberian? I mean, were they were they in fact were they in fact the ones who made the constellations? Were they the ones who made the first R? Hmm. All right, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Quick mid-show break here. Um, contact info first, and then a recommendation. If you want to contact the show, this show, where did the road go? It's where did the road go dot com. The emails are there. Uh, if you want to send in a listener story, whatever, it's all it's all available right there. And uh, all the links to social media, all the shows going all the way back. There's some uh, extra stuff. I mean, you can explore the page. It's, it, there's a lot of stuff there. If you like heavy music, check out um, The Last Exit for the Lost, my music show, which is uh, another weekly show that I do. And uh, that is at thelastexit.org. And we play a lot of stuff that is uh, kind of rare and underground and good. And we have live performances and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to help support this show, uh, give us a rating on whatever you're listening to. Uh, give us a good good five-star rating. Uh, leave us a good review um, or become a Patreon. It's only $3 a month. And you get extra content constantly. And the show a week early. All right. As for recommendations, I'm going to go with a TV show that I haven't quite finished yet. So I'm going to put that little asterisk here. I think I have an episode and a half left. Uh, it's called Bodies. And uh, it was highly recommended to me, and I finally sat down and watched it. It's a UK show, um, and it is really, really good. Not only is it well done, but it's it's it has a very decent uh, mystery time travel type of thing going on with it. Uh, the basic premise is that a dead body is found at four different time periods. That's exactly the time, exactly the same. So it's found in like uh, Jack the Ripper's time. It's found on Whitechapel. Uh, and then in like 1941 and 2023 and like 2060, and they're trying to, you know, the later people are realizing, oh, this has happened before. What the hell's going on? This is the exact same body. I wasn't sure from the description if I was going to like it, but man, it is a really intriguing series and it's very original. So I highly recommend checking that out. 
It is available on Netflix, and I believe it's just one season. I don't think they were ever planning on going beyond that, but I haven't reached the end yet, so the end could ruin it. I don't know, but I'm pretty close to the end, and it just keeps getting better. So that's my recommendation, Bodies. Again, available on Netflix if you want to check it out. All right, back to the show. I'm here with Bernie Taylor, and um, we're talking about, well, ancient humans, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Um, what do you think about, like, the Neanderthals and such? Question. <clears throat> I've looked at, I've seriously looked at every Neanderthal posed art. None of them are. None of them are. And in every case, people went within the preconception that well, the, lead, the project leader was one of the so-called Neanderthal experts on the world. And in every case, they, they botched up the analysis. There was one that came out La Roche last, like, maybe August. A Neanderthal art, La, La roche Cotard cave in France. <clears throat> and they, they, they say that the dating of the cave was, was I think they said it was um, 60,000 years ago. And, and the earliest Homo sapiens in Europe were 55,000. Thousand years ago, and so since there's five thousand years difference, and we got these marks in the caves, they couldn't have been Homo sapiens. Well, that's like the reason. The reason where we get this Homo sapien dating from at fifty five thousand years ago, I believe it was um it was a tooth with some with some artifacts, some like um lithic stone stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, but what's happened is at, we go back to that Gorham cave story. They said it must be known anthol because they said this layer that creeped up the wall was at forty thousand years ago, and Homo sapiens weren't in Europe until thirty eight thousand eight thousand years ago. So thirty eight thousand years ago was the date two thousand thirteen. Okay. Now the date is fifty five thousand years ago, based on um, new archaeological, more found archaeological evidence, which pushed back the dates. Well, it's pretty obvious that's you know based on these gates being pushed back with more artifacts that there will be, we're going to be at 50, we're going to be at 60, we're going to be at 70,000 at some point. But what happens is, is that like in the Gorham case, they, what they said, they, 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 they changed their story. They say, well, maybe our thing is if it, it's Neanderthal, maybe it's because they proved it Neanderthal because it creeps up the wall sort of thing. Um, they maybe that's 60,000 years ago. So the, the people at the cave of bones, when they show you this image on Netflix or the, the, the Gorham Cave image compared with the, the Rising Star image, they put down the Gorham Cave one as 60,000 years ago. Mm. And so they 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 redid the dates <clears throat> to fit the, the Gorham Cave, which was totally nonsensical dates to begin with. They reset the dates to fit their argument in South Africa. Gotcha. Um, and so start the the so, so but going back to Neanderthals, I've looked at different different caves and different images, and I've really studied these things with an open mind. And none of them are they're all they're all same styles and the same sort of characters we find in Homo sapiens art. And in every case, the, the dating is always on the, the line. You know, it's within five thousand years of the earlier states of Homo sapiens in Europe. And so the, the storyline of, of Neanderthals is that they did not make figurative art as we make figurative art. They didn't make horses, they didn't make oryx, they didn't make ibex. But that doesn't mean that Neanderthals were 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 smart. And this is what I would this is what I would say. So what, the question can be asked, well, why didn't Neanderthal make art? Whereas how can we create art that we say is made by Neanderthals? Well, the art that all the art that we find that far back is in caves. And is real if you kind of think about it, why would anybody and logically, if you can see um, you know, the stars in the sky, if you can see a, a deer on the horizon, why do you need to remake them in the cave? Yeah. And let's say that the, the deer is represented in the night sky by a constellation. You put those together. But why do you need to put the image in the night sky and the image in the um, on the, the animal on the horizon into the cave itself? Well, the Neanderthals probably said, well, we never even thought about it. They never thought, why did I do it? But we did. And when we did that, what we did is we started to create a scientific record. We created books of sorts. And by having repeatable information of both the animals and how they're, they're organized and how they – ultimately, we, you could say these animals are in the night sky's constellations. Um, they create a scientific record in the underworld, the underworld of the cave. And from their perspective, what they were doing, from my perspective, what I think, they were creating this record of, of how to teach apprentices, apprentices, um, their knowledge. So in the case of the the, um, the record, the all these African animals in Iberian caves, we that's the origin story of where they came from and how you can get back again. Mm. But so Neanderthals, based on what we what we know about them, they actually didn't travel very far. They, you know, they traveled from one in one generation might travel from one valley to another, but they didn't walk walk north and south. Across the span of um, Africa, like they never went into Africa, Southern Africa anywhere, and so Neanderthals, they did. It's not a leap of science. It's not a leap of thought or a leap of imagination. But they were probably just happy as heck looking at the deer on the horizon, <laughs> and and maybe in the night sky. 
they and so but what they did is they lost their ability they actually they didn't they weren't able to carry on knowledge in the way that we do um by as we do today by books and as they did 34,000 years ago in the on the wall caves so they lost consistency in the in the narration and how they passed on the information and that's so why do we exist today is because we built up a body of knowledge from deep in the Paleolithic on these cave walls and the Neanderthals did it from you know they, they they spoke about it. They right. sung about it. Maybe yeah, um, yeah. They pointed to the night sky, but they lost they lost the consistency to make it science as we see science today. Now, what what do you make of the idea that some of these symbols on cave walls and stuff are likely from shamanic rituals, hallucinogens, things like that? Good question. So, um, so we're we're in 2024. And nobody has asked me that question in three years. Hmm. Okay, three years. So where do, so where does that question emanate from? Um, it emanates from um, it starts from a fellow named David Lewis Williams who wrote a book in like 1998 or something. It was called The Mind in the Cave, and Lewis Williams is South African. Um, South, I mean, he's like really South African versus um, I think he's always lived there. And what he did was he looked at the the the, the rock art in South Africa, and he looked at the he looked at anthropological um, information from the San people in the region. Okay. And there's some some serious problems with that anthropological information, and the anthropologists are all over it, and they say it's bunk. And what the story was, was the information came from two, about 200 years ago, and the anthropologist interviewed people that San people that he he invited to have dinner from the prisons they were living in, and so the, so and the San people, these San prisoners, told him all they wanted to hear. Well, of course they did because he was feeding them. So it's either you eat whatever the heck they gave him in the prison, or he had you know kangaroo, not kangaroo in the case of kangaroo South Africa, but you have you know gazelle on my dinner plate here. And so he he so the problem so we start off this problem of taking information of two hundred years ago um, and, and incorporating it into to look at rock art today. Now another problem was, is those the San hadn't made rock art for hundreds of years. So those people who that were interviewed had no direct knowledge of who made the rock art and what was the meaning of them. Only what San were at, at, during their time were interpreting in it, and which they were fudging the story to get another great meal of gazelle and you know, <laughs> right. wh- white wine. Okay. And so there's a huge problem with that story. And so what uh, what David Lewis Williams said at that time, because he's changed, he's changed since then. He said that um, based on the stories that he was reading, this anthropological stuff, that the the, the son, like so called shaman, he was called the shaman, would you know touch the wall and he would become one with the with the wall and the animal. And uh, he took this concept into the upper pillar of the caves in Europe and said, well, it's some sort of light deprivation. And they they, they went into the caves. They'd been there for long periods of time, and the lights went out. The lights were out, and they um, they just it just exploded on the panels, the, the animals. A few problems with it. I've been to these caves, and they're they're yes, they are dark, and but they're also like really wet, slippery, okay? mm. and and they're dangerous now when they're even paved. I can't imagine what they were like, you know, a long time ago, right? Thirty four thousand years, really, really dangerous. So nobody is nobody's there's no light duration. Nobody's crawling through caves in the dark. Never ever happened. Okay? So what happened? <clears throat> so when when and, uh, David Lewis Williams came out with this, people said, well, they're not going to say it's light deprivation. They're going to say if you start talking about shaman shamanic people, which is really comes out of Siberia. Right, they're gonna say it's drugs, and uh, and so Lewis now he said no 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 <laughs> no 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 no, <laughs> they're gonna buy my story, they're gonna like my story of the light deprivation, which is built on this concept of shamanism, so called shamanism in South Africa from San people who were in prisons two hundred years ago mm. who knew nothing about, never had no direct connection to rock art. Maybe it wasn't two hundred years ago, maybe it was like hundred fifty years earlier, and people would get to feed gazelle out of prison, <laughs> so they would tell him any the anthropologist anything he wanted to know. So that's the that's the that's how it happened. So Graham Hancock comes along, and that's where he, it's, that's probably where you heard the, the shot yes. the story of Taylor. He wrote a book called um, Supernatural. So Graham Hancock, he he read the Mind the Cave. Um, I think he he might have even like talked to David Lewis William at some point. And Hancock says, no, 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 it's not light deprivation; it's psychedelic substances. Now Graham Hancock had no knowledge, no evidence that any of this had anything to do with psychedelic substances. There are no there are no no known images of mushrooms or anything else in these caves. Zero. Absolutely none. Um, but what we do have is theriantrum. We have these characters that that, that uh you know, the bird man type of thing, and right. the merman with the fish and the centaur man on the horse. With the ancient Greeks talked about centaurs. You know, children, you know, you go you can go to the movies today, you can see centaurs. No one's doing drugs to, to see a centaur. 
it's it was part of it. The, they're animists. The people they believe they believe that the horses and the the ibex and the oryx, all these animals were their their cousins, their brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, sort of thing. They were one with the animals. That's why they they integrated one over the other. So you say you say you have the strength, you know, the the, the, the wise owl, the strength of an ox, that sort of stuff, fast as a stallion. Um, so they were not exactly. So the theriantrope thing was really about animism, and animism is a root of the tree. That shamanism is one branch. So before shamanism is animism, and animism people believe that everybody's connected, um, and not just connect with the other animal beings, but they are connect. They, they mountains is a spirit. You know, the thunder is the voice from the from the clouds. That sort of stuff. And so the, the people are animists. Um, and when you do, so David Lewis Williams has since changed his narrative. He's moved away from shamanism as he was saying it. Um, but what happened was people went down that, that road. He created a new dogma. Mm-hmm. Um, and people still re- they repeat a story that was back in 1990s that David Lewis Williams has also walked away from. Um, and so there's a, and people, um, so that's, that's where shamanism comes from. That that is literally the, the storyline, the narrative of how we have it today. Um, and and Graham Han- Hancock, we're not. I have no contact with Graham Hancock, but he, that's the TED talk he did about um, you know, consciousness and you know cave art and all that sort of stuff. How he presented that was really compelling, totally compelling, absolutely. And um, and if you don't know what, if you if and in the time that he did that, he actually had no other information. All he had was the David Lewis stuff, and then every other, all the other information out there about the cave art was what the archaeologists they were. This is how many horses in the cave. This is how many ibex. This is how many orcs. There was no interpretation of a pillar cave art. Lewis Williams was the first one, as as I know, to actually come out with an actual interpretation. Don't agree with it, but he had that interpretation. <laughs> so Hancock really he drew on Lewis Williams. He switched it off into shrooms and things like that. Right. But I would tell you, it is totally impossible, completely impossible, that those cave bars, that shrooms had anything to do with those images. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Here's, do you ever take shrooms? No. I, I was going to say, I haven't done any hallucinogens, so I, I can't, you know, vouch for, for that one <laughs> so, way or the other. Have, but, you ever, have you ever, like, do you ever have, like, an injury, go to the hospital, and they give you, like, uh, some sort of, like, um, opioid? Nope. So you never had a... So people, people out there in a podcast land, if you've never <laughs> done shrooms and you've, and you probably had some people, a lot of people had some sort of opioid. What happens is, is that your mind, if you're looking at an image, okay, and your mind is kind of gets kind of fuzzy, not like alcohol fuzzy, but fuzzy in a way that your 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 eyes are trying to find recognize what the image is. And so, if you have, I'm looking at the Skype screen right now. It says recording started by Soraya. Well, if I was looking at that, and I was on some sort of opioid or, or shrooms i would see recording i the r would become a b and the e the e and the c might become two eyes looking at me mm. okay, that's really important because the the cave art as as i've been discussing it these animals are exactly as they are in the wild as you can find them on the caves and all these animals are actually constellations in the night sky but not only that but they actually they also depict pareidolia in in on the terrestrial landscape so you find these Sort of paradoia mountain. You know, in South Africa, you find a paradoia of a giraffe in a mountain. Um, you can see, people can see that on my blog. Yeah. But as you go into the Iberian Peninsula, you find lots of paradoia of that depict exactly what these images look like. We talked about the Gorham Cave before that etching. Is that that's actually a mountain called Mohassan? It actually you can overlay over Mohassan, which is the tallest mountain in the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, that hashtag, so-called hashtag, are actually the lines in Mohassan. It's, it's Mohassan. You can lay one over the other, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and people found animals within those lines. Well, if you went shrooms and you were an opioid, and we were both looking at Mohassan, we would not be seeing the same things. Your <laughs> eyes might squiggle a little this Your lines might squiggle this way. Your lines might squiggle a little that way. And if you were trying to draw it when you're on any of these substances, you could. So I'm just talking about seeing it, it'd be lo- looking different. Well, because that, so you're looking at something, this mountain that has this paradoia, these images, and then you're trying to draw it on something. Well, then what you've done is you've seen, you've got the swiggles that your after your eyes are seeing, and then your eyes are seeing a completely different set of swiggles <laughs> on the paper or animal skin or whatever you're doing. Um, and then what you're doing is you got to bring this thing to the cave. Well, you sure as heck not going to be doing it on any type of opioid or shrooms because these, these caves are really wet, they're slippery, and they're even that paved now. They're dangerous, and they were not paved thirty-four thousand years ago. Right, and so there's no way in heck anybody is going into these caves on any substance. 
<clears throat> they're at the top of the game when they go into these things. So the it's from from my perspective, looking at the um, because the images there, the underworld, the Truster Plane, and the night sky, and Truster Plane, not just the animals, but also the Paradoia of the mountains. There's too many pieces to put together. To um, if somebody's on any sort of hallucinogenic substance, and even if even if you and I were sitting staring sitting next to each other looking at Mahasan, um, we would cut, and we were both on anything, any sort of isolated substance, you and I would both come up with a different interpretation of what that is. Okay. But yet, people over many thousands of years, talking 20,000 of years, went to the same places and they, they walked away with the same, the same images. And people that could not have, they actually couldn't, based on that when caves like collapsed and interests and things like that, they couldn't have seen each other's images. They could only have seen the paradoia animal origin of them. Um, and so the it's completely logistically impossible um, to so it, to have anything to do with hallucinogenic substances. Um, I, I do want to say you have a, quite a lot of illustrations in the blogs about this, uh, showing examples and all of that stuff, so people can can visually see it if they go to your your website. Oh, absolutely! And, and my YouTube, and on the web page, there's lots of YouTube links. I've given uh, 25 scientific conferences uh, presentations on the subject. And we're talking psychology, religion, archaeology, anthropology, astronomy, mythology, it, it, uh, ornithology, um, I mean, a lot of different presentations. And people, they're just amazed. It's like they've never heard this story before. How? And, and, and not that it's not just as one mountain and one animal and one cave. I mean, I go through, I mean, I, in one presentation, I'll do 12. Of them, and they're like absolutely amazed. And they can see the same thing. And they wonder, they ask the question, why don't they know this? How yeah. come? How come this is not? How come this did not come out of Spain? They, I mean, they see it in the conferences, but they they didn't get it in the Spanish media. And there's a story about that. There's a pre-story of this whole thing, its own dogma, um, and it goes back to Picasso. Believe it or not, Picasso. Mm. So late late eight, late nineteen late eighteen hundreds, the Altamira cave was on, on earth on earth or opened up in, in northern Spain. And people said, and there were animals there that were extinct, like the orcs. And people said, well, it must be fraud. Um, and it's a movie about Altamira starring Antonio Barris. There's actually another movie uh, series it was on TV about um, Picasso starring Antonio Barris. Uh, he's like the he's like the Spanish guy. If you want to you want an actor. Um, so they, they, Picasso comes in. Well, they, they invited Picasso in to determine if it was a fraud or not. Well, Picasso Picasso says none of us could have made anything like this. It's very interesting. So therefore, no none of Picasso's contemporaries who were the, who were the top of their time. This was incredible art, such as Altamira, the bison on the seal and that sort of stuff. That they couldn't have made it. And Picasso said so. So the so all of a sudden, so therefore it's not a fraud. But then the question is still out there. Well, who made this and when? And there was a the the, the cap, Spain is a, is a Roman Catholic country. And it's not a Roman Catholic country today. Well, definitely it was very it was very um um it was old school Catholic. Okay, it was about um, um complete authority type of Catholic. Um, and it remains to that today, because what happened was Picasso goes into the cave and he walks out and he takes images, actual masks from the cave, and some of them he uses on his paintings. And so Les Demoiselles, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is the first modern art painting by Picasso, where Matt uses two masks that came right out of the, the Altamira cave. Absolutely fascinating. And he uses them, uses these masks and other characters from caves throughout his entire career. Well, Picasso, um, he's exiled into France. He has this whole narrative. Every most of what I'm telling you today, he knew. He 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 didn't know the South Africa stuff, but he knew that these were animals were paradoia in the mountains, and he knew that there were constellations. He figured that out. Okay, mm. so I'm not. I haven't discovered anything in this respect. Um, so because, what Picasso does, is he's exiled in France um, because there's a civil war in Spain, and on, on one side of the civil war is the the democratic democratic elected government that is overthrown by General Franco. And Franco was aligned with the Spanish church at the time, as well as two other big fascists of the time, which we know them well in Italy and Germany. Right. And the U.S. was, on, by the way, the U.S. was supportive of, of that side at that time. But mm. World War II comes around after the Spanish Civil War is over, and then we are then at war with the fascists. Um, and uh, so there's a narrative going on there. Well, Picasso was really ticked off about the whole Spanish experience. And he decides he is some of his works. He doesn't want to be shown in in Spain, including Guernica. He says, as long as Franco was alive, Guernica will never be shown in in Spain. Well, bottom line is that Franco didn't want him to show it. So, <laughs> so Fra Franco and Picasso were at odds. And Frank and Picasso was really the guy who figured this crap out, all this stuff. And uh, and I can go through one. I do a lot of presentations on his on, on how he borrowed from the cave art. So Picasso is Picasso basically disappears from the record. 
in terms of what he had learned. And uh, so we lost that. We lost this connection of, of someone who spent a lot of time in caves um, and had figured a lot of it out. <clears throat> the other major player in, up, in uphill cave art was the Abbey Bruel, B-R-U-I-E-L, something like that. So he's a Catholic priest, and he, he's on the side. He's he, I'm not going to say he's on Frankel's side, but he was on the side of the Catholic Church, and he had a definite dogma of what he would repeat. So there are things that he saw in caves. He obviously would have seen in caves. And he did not talk about it um, in the way that it's represented in the cave. Because okay. his narrative could not be about spirituality 34,000 years ago. His nar- narrative couldn't be about Greek, um, Greek mythology originating from the cave 34,000 years ago. His, myth- his, his narration had to be about these people were intelligent. So he, called, he said it was all hunting magic, all hunting magic. But we know it wasn't hunting magic. It had nothing to do with hunting. Because the animals that are represented in the walls of the caves are not the are not found in the bones of the animals that ate. So the, the diet was almost entirely reindeer. We find very few reindeer up to the cave art. So they weren't eating. They weren't eating the horses, and you know they certainly weren't eating giraffes because they weren't even right. in South Africa. So we have this narrative of of history where Spain has been trapped in their own history because. For, Camp Franco is still in the politics. They don't dominate the politics, but they're in, the, in that balance in, in one of the parties. And the, the institutions, you know, the older institutions, the, those with the money who make decisions are still their inheritance of Franco. And if we were, if this was you in Spain right now, we couldn't have this conversation. As the, as the um, host, <clears throat> you would say, Bernie, can't talk about that. Can't talk about that. Because I've been on podcasts. They've said, can't talk about that. Mm. Um, and so what, this, this knowledge was literally lost under Picasso. Wow. And then me basically stumbling upon it you know, step by step, I, um, I resurfaced a lot of it. <clears throat> and I also resur- resurfaced why people lost, lost the information, why they lost this data, and why people in Spain don't want to talk about it. Because if you're going to talk about this, if you're going to talk about Franco, and you're going to talk about the Catholic Church, and you're going to talk about being odds with Picasso, and but the Basque people, which figured the same story, which is in, in northern Spain, and which Picasso defended and Franco wanted to wipe off the earth, as we as we saw through of uh, Guernica, mm-hmm. um, you're bringing up, you're digging up, you know, graves, and I mean, we're talking about graves. <clears throat> when Fra- during the Spanish Civil War, one side would walk into a village and shoot, you know, line everybody up from the other side and shoot them. And then the next day, the other side from another village would come through and shoot, their, you know, yeah, the, the ones who 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 were on t- team A from the other day. So this was a it was a brutal war. It was more brutal than the American Civil War. Wow. Because they, they had more, you know, airplanes and bombs and all sorts of stuff. So we have this, this narrative that was boxed up in Spain. All the pieces were there. And so people on the, on the alternative channels, um, the speakers out there on the internet, they're, they're looking for, they say, well, why don't we have these pieces? Where are they? I mean, how, what, something happened. For a long time, people knew something happened for the, the ancient Egyptians. I mean, it's obvious. The ancient Egyptians did not create all that stuff. And then, then well, Beckley Tepe pops up. And then they say, say well, what, what happened before Gobekli Tepe? Because this thing just didn't pop up either. Something happened before Gobekli Tepe. Something happened before all these people and all these, all these magnificent and sites. Well, the, the, the information for that goes back 34 to 36,000 years ago in the Iberian Peninsula. That was locked up and literally still remains locked up in, Sp- in Spanish archaeology today. And people, everything, everything I've talked about, every, people have seen the images, they got it. But they can't talk about it. The only thing they can do is stay within to the the dogma of the government, um, or or not to muck things up. You know, have people shoot each other again is to count ibex, count horses, count orcs. Yeah, and that is that is archaeology of of Spain today. All the stuff stuff we talked about today cannot exist because if it does exist, it asks the question: Why? How? How did we lose it? Yeah, um, where has it been? Which upsets like. A huge apple cart, much bigger than anybody, you know, complaining about Zahi Was. This is about, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it's their, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's their trauma, their trauma. Yeah, it's their uh, national trauma. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, tell people where they can find you online. Absolutely. So I use beforeRyan.com, the internet, uh, my webpage. But I use Before Ryan on like Facebook and Twitter and all these sort of places. Um, and there's, there's incredible images out there. As I said, they're not my images. I didn't take the photos. Um, and they, because I, so I can't take the photos of the caves. It's illegal for me to go take the photos <laughs> of the caves. Um, right. We're all, we just talked about the last 10 minutes. Um, but it's 
before Ryan is out there, and I've been on over 100 podcast interviews, and I think it'd be really cool for people, if they can, go find the one we did four years ago, because that talks about the Galar disc and the Al Castillo cave and the constellations and the animals. Yeah. And it, it really it puts these two together in a way that it's we're, we, you and I have been on a journey um, over time, not just my individual journey, but we're, we're narrowing the story as is really unveiled. All right. Well, thank you, Bernie. Great. And we'll do it again. Thank you, Sarah. All right. I want to give a special shout out right here to all of my Patreons. It is because of you that this show is possible. I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, Billuminati, Madeleine J, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Midnight Review Presents, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, CJ, Craig Parmenter, Daniel, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J, J Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, John Hooling, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Schmooples, a devourer of mortal souls, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, The Esoteric Book Club Podcast, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varush K., Victoria, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, Colin Karras, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much for your support. All right, there is a Patreon segment to go along with the show with Bernie where we talk about uh, some lost civilizations and things like that. Uh, if you've become a patron, it's only $3 a month. You get new content, extra content all month long. Some bonuses here and there, as well as a uh, the show a week early, usually. All right. I do want to welcome a few new patrons. Seed Person 1, Jimmy Tennant, David Bauman, Jane Nagal, Charlie Stipe, and L. Doyle. Thank you all for joining up. I hope you like the extra content, and thank you for the support. All right. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>